Angel, listen to the sermon, okay? Listen to the sermon of the praise. Understand, okay? right now. The idea is coming from conservative writers in the Novus Ordo as a result of this new document promulgated by Bergoglio entitled the Fiducia Supplicans. In case you have not heard, this document permits Novus Ordo priests to confer blessings upon sodomitic couples. I hesitate even to speak about or describe the substance of this document because it is so vile. However, because it is causing such grave confusion, I feel it's necessary to shed light upon this subject, as disturbing as it is. All normal sane people realize that blessing a sodomite couple is gravely sinful, since it is the public sanctioning of something which is intrinsically evil. Certain writers try to qualify the content of the document by saying that it does not really permit a blessing of a union as a union, but merely of two potentially repentant individuals at the same time. But this is not satisfactory. It still confers the impression that the church is sanctioning something which is gravely evil. It is absurd as blessing a murderer who is still holding a gun with smoke coming out of the gun because he just shot and killed someone. Even if the murderer, murderer were repentant, it would still confer the impression that the church were sanctioning murder. And in this case, this most recent promulgation certainly does confer the impression that the church sanctions sodomy. Now, this should not surprise anyone. The Novus Ordo clergy is full of sodomites and effeminate men and men who want to promote and celebrate the things that sodomites do. And they have been doing this sort of thing, sanctioning these unnatural acts, for many decades. This is merely the formalization of something which in practice has been going on in dioceses for many years. Still, even non-Catholics are shocked by the sheer boldness of the document. It is not only shockingly un-Catholic, it is altogether unnatural. And since it appears to be part of the Church's infallible magisterium, how do the Novus Ordo apologists deal with this problem? First, they admit that the Roman Pontiff cannot, in his official teachings to the Universal Church, teach error pertaining to faith and morals. And this is true. But then they say that if the Roman Pontiff teaches error, the Catholic faithful must take the position that the teaching is not a true teaching of the Church, but they must continue to recognize the legitimacy of his papacy. Their position is that even though this teaching does not form part of the magisterium because it is evil, nevertheless, the subject who has promulgated it to the universal church retains his teaching authority over the church. In other words, Bergoglio must still be recognized as Pope even though he has done this thing. To respond to this position, we have to understand what it means for something to be a church teaching. In other words, what is it that causes something to become part of the church's magisterium? By cause here, I mean more specifically what is called in philosophy the efficient cause. An efficient cause is the cause that brings a thing into existence. The conservative apologists say that what brings a magisterial teaching into existence is when it is in conformity with what the Church has always taught. 
If it is in conformity, they say, then it is magisterial. This is false. What causes something to be magisterial, what brings a teaching into existence as a magisterial teaching, is its universal promulgation to the church by those who have the authority to teach from Christ, namely the Roman pontiff and the bishops in union with him. This does not mean that the Pope produces the faith itself. He does not, nor does he invent new doctrines or new morals. Faith and morals come from God and from nature. They do not come from the Pope. Divine revelation comes from God. But the act of teaching the faith, the business of teaching this divine revelation to the world, is an act proper to the Roman pontiff and the bishops in union with him. For this reason, everything that the apostles taught and everything that the successors of St. Peter have ever taught, together with everything that the bishops in union with the successors of St. Peter have always taught, is the magisterium. What causes it to become magisterial is that it is taught by those who have the authority in the church to teach. Now, the fact that the magisterium is always in conformity with what has been taught in the past is one of its necessary characteristics. In fact, it is one of the signs of the indefectibility of the church, that the same faith has always been taught from the time of the apostles until the present day, without the slightest deviation, without the slightest trace of error against faith or morals. But this characteristic is not the cause of magisterial teaching, any more than a dog's tail is the cause of it being a dog. The tail is a necessary characteristic of the dog. All dogs have tails. But it does not cause the dog to come into existence. What caused the dog, what brought the dog into existence, is the parents of the dog. And what brings a magisterial teaching into existence is not its conformity with what has been taught in the past, but its promulgation by the Roman pontiff to the universal church. Let us, let us work through this analogy for a moment. If you have a father dog and a mother dog, the effect is always and at all times a baby dog, a puppy. It cannot possibly be anything else except a puppy. Puppies do not contain some elements which are dog elements and some elements which are non-dog elements. It will always be 100% a puppy with 100% the nature of a dog. And in the same way, if you have promulgation on faith and morals by the Roman pontiff, to the universal church. The effect is always, and at all times, an infallible magisterial teaching. It cannot be possibly anything else except an infallible magisterial teaching. It cannot contain some elements which are infallible magisterium and other elements which are non-infallible magisterium. It will always be 100% infallible magisterium. If something is magisterial, then it is infallible, even if the magisterium is only ordinary magisterium, as is ostensibly the case here with this document, Fiducia Supplicans. And it is infallible by nature, not by accident. Let me explain what that means. If something is a dog, then it has ne necessarily the nature of a dog it does not accidentally have the nature of a dog. In other words, it cannot be something other than a dog. Two dogs cannot produce something which is half cat, half dog. It will always be a dog, and it will necessarily have the nature of a domesticated canine animal, 100%. Now, it is perfectly possible for it to have any number of different characteristics. It could have long fur or short fur, it might have hair instead of fur. It could be black, white, brown, or gray. It could have a long tail or a short tail. 
But no matter how many combinations of these accidental attributes we can imagine, the thing will always be a dog, a domesticated canine animal. Now, if something is part of the universal ordinary magisterium, then it has the nature of infallibility. That is to say, it cannot contain any error in faith or morals by necessity. The magisterium is, does not happen to be infallible, it is not accidentally infallible, but necessarily infallible. In other words, it can never become something non-infallible. When the Roman pontiff, in union with the bishops, promulgates something to the universal church on faith and morals, the product which results from this cannot be partly infallible and partly non-infallible. It will be always 100% infallible. Now, it is perfectly possible for it to have a number of other characteristics. It might be written in Latin, Greek, or Italian. It might be a short statement or a lengthy statement. It might quote certain verses of sacred scripture and not quote other verses of sacred scripture. It might draw from certain doctors or theologians, but not from other doctors or theologians. It might address certain contemporary issues, or it might simply be a deeper penetration of the mysteries of faith. But no matter how many combinations of accidental qualities, accidental attributes we can imagine, what is taught in the magisterium in this manner on faith and morals will always be infallible. The reason has to do with the marks of the church. The church is one holy, catholic, and apostolic. The church is holy. The holiness of the church means that it can never teach error universally. If the church did teach error universally, it would be an instrument in the hands of the devil which he would use to deceive souls, keep them in a condition of ignorance, or tempt them into heresy and apostasy, all of which would draw them to hell. But the very purpose for which the Catholic Church exists is to draw souls to heaven. The universal teaching of error is characteristic of all schismatic sects and all false religions, but it can never be a characteristic of the Church the Church is the mystical body of Christ, as Christ is holy and teaches infallibly, so the Church is holy and teaches infallibly. And the only subjects to whom authority to teach has been given in the Church are the Roman Pontiff and the bishops in union with him. If their teachings on faith and morals are false, then the gates of hell will have prevailed against the Church. Therefore, their teachings on faith and morals can never be false. The Church cannot impose on the faithful a, per a pernicious or harmful doctrine <coughs> in matters pertaining to faith and morals, even if it does not make a final and irrevocable judgment on the matter. The Church is also Catholic. This means, among other things, that its teachings are always in perfect harmony with what the Apostles taught and with what all the bishops and popes of all times, have always taught since the time of the Apostles. Now to use a blessing to convey the impression that sin is sanctioned by the Church is clearly against what the Apostles and all the Popes and Bishops have always taught. If it were accepted as part of Church teaching, then the Church would not be Catholic, since it would be divorcing itself from its past. And the Church is always in conformity with its past. It does never break from it. The Church is also one. This means that there is only one faith and one morality in the Church. There are not multiple faiths or multiple moralities. What we see in the context of the Novus Ordo right now are bishops opposing bishops on a matter pertaining to morality, fundamental morality. It's not a question of, I think this might be a prudent decision to make. It's a matter of good and evil. You find this mark of opposition in every schismatic sect, but you do not find this mark of opposition in the Catholic Church. When the Methodists recently went into schism over the matter of homosexual marriage, 
No one was surprised, because it is in the nature of Protestant sects to split from each other whenever the people disagree on something. But it is in the nature of the Church to remain united on all things pertaining to faith and morals. This evident disagreement between conservative bishops and liberal bishops on a fundamental matter of morals is a sign that if the Novus Ordo religion were the true religion, then the Catholic Church would be a divided church instead of a united church. If Bergoglio truly is the Pope, then the bishops who have rejected his teaching have effectively excommunicated themselves. There cannot be such a thing as a Catholic Church that has two distinct groups, one which adheres to papal teachings and Catholic morals, and one which does not adhere to papal teachings and Catholic morals. This is a sign of a false sect, not the true Church. In the true Church there is only one true morality, Catholic morality, and this morality is infallibly and permanently upheld by the successors of St. Peter. Speaking of St. Peter, the Church is also apostolic. This means that there will always be successors to St. Peter in the apostolic see, and that these successors will always have the same grace that St. Peter had, the grace that is the grace of the papacy. This grace enables them to teach in the name of Christ. When they teach, it is as Christ teaching. Pope Leo XIII said that to say that the popes could teach error is to say that the Holy Ghost could use popes as an instrument for the spreading of error to the universal church, which he said is blasphemous. The same pope also said that it is necessary to adhere with a firm and unwavering assent to everything that the Roman pontiffs teach or ever will teach, and whenever circumstances require to make this assent public. Therefore, if Bergoglio is the pope, then all the faithful, bishops included, must give their firm and unwavering assent to the blessing of sodomite couples. Now let us turn our attention back to this document, Fiducia Suplicans. We certainly agree with those who say that it cannot be part of the Church's magisterium. It is not part of the Church's magisterium. But for this to be the case, one of the things that cause magisterial teaching to come into existence must, therefore, be lacking. Just as if we are looking at a cat, we necessarily know that its parents cannot be dogs. If we look at error, we necessarily know that it cannot come from an infallible subject. Remember that the magisterium must be promulgated universally by the Roman pontiff. This document is not a mistake made in a Tuesday sermon. It's not a casual remark made in a Wednesday audience. It is not a private letter to someone expressing an opinion. All of the characteristics rendering it universal teaching are there. It is also promulgated. It is published to the Catholic bishops and faithful. And it does concern morals. It concerns good and evil. Therefore, what is lacking must be the third thing, the Roman pontiff, or the Roman pontiff in union with the bishops. But either way, the Roman pontiff is necessarily involved in the magisterium. Take out the Roman pontiff, and you take out the magisterium. So if this document is magisterial, then Bergoglio must be the Roman pontiff. If this document is not magisterial, or even if it merely contains one single error against faith or morals, then Bergoglio cannot be the Roman pontiff. And since it does contain an outrageous error against Catholic morality, Bergoglio cannot be the Roman pontiff. No one ought to submit to him, or the ministers affiliated with him, or even the ministers who are not affiliated with him, but claim to be affiliated with him. No one ought to listen to their sermons, no one ought to go to them for sacraments, no one ought to seek moral advice from them, no one ought to submit to them to be judged by them, since they have no power to judge. To sum up, 
The Church's magisterium is infallible by necessity, and the magisterium is irrevocably caused by the Roman pontiff, together with his bishops, promulgating a teaching on faith and morals universally to the Church. Deny these things, and you deny the Church. Deny the Church, and you deny the divine founder of the Church. This is why the conservative Novus Ordo position on this matter is extremely dangerous to souls. As for us, we hope and we pray and we do penance that they give up these perilous falsehoods and embrace the Church's true doctrine. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Angel. Angel. Okay. It's round three. Okay. Okay. See to it that you listen to the right sermon, okay?